Hey everybody, Brandon Niles here, host of the most accurate podcast, senior writer, editor over at 444.com. Uh, I usually try to keep things reasonably light and positive, but today I'm hating. I'm a straight up hater. I'm checking out ADPs that have gotten way out of hand. Uh, and I may not hate the players specifically that I'm talking about today, but I absolutely despise where they're going in drafts. Uh, before I get into that, as a reminder, if you like this video, please hit that like button, share it with all your friends, and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find lots of excellent video content. As far as ADP is concerned, I'm taking a look at the underdog best ball ADP we have at 444.com slash underdog dash ADP, trying to identify players to avoid based on their average draft position. Uh, now, just kind of as a caveat here tournament play when you're loading up a whole bunch of uh different rosters and you're doing best ball in that regard uh you know i might sprinkle these players in for lineup diversity but generally speaking i'm not gonna have a lot of this even in tournament play and in the isolated leagues and redraft which is really where i'm focusing i'm not gonna have very many of these players on my on my roster at all uh here are the five players that i have right now that are going way way too high and i'm not about any of it so uh, i'm gonna start right at the top uh, I'll admit I tend to be overly skittish when it tends when it comes to guys coming off injuries, and I know he's only 26, but I want no parts of Christian McCaffrey at a 2.9 ADP. He's going top three. I've seen him go number one. I've seen him drop all the way to four. That's about as far as I've seen him go in drafts. Uh, this guy has played in 10 of the Panthers' last 33 games. I'm not interested. Uh, I love Adam Hutchison's article that he comes up and he talks about how the injuries aren't connected and they might be random, but he has had a myriad of injuries since his 403 touches in 2019. He has over 1,100 career touches already. Um, he might just be breaking down. After 2019, he bulked up. Uh, we saw all that stuff on Twitter, all those pictures coming out about how big he was and how muscular he was, and he just looked yoked. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you add a whole lot of muscle to your fast, quick twitch body, and then you start having soft muscle and soft tissue injuries and things of the sort. Uh, I love this kid. I'm rooting for him. He's fun to watch, but no thank you at that cost. Let's not lose our leagues in the first round for the third straight season with the same guy. I'm not doing it. There are other players I'd rather take that high. Sure, if he's there in the third round, I'll take him as my RB2, but obviously that's not happening. So let's go to the second round. I don't like Mark Andrews with an ADP of 17.1. Love the player, but he had 107 receptions on 153 targets last year. 1361 yards. Those were all career numbers for him. I don't like career years. Like Cooper Cup almost made this list because he's going so early in the first round. I do think Cooper Cup is going to be an elite wide receiver one, however. So he didn't make this list. But watch out for players that have career years. There's a reason it's a career year, right? It doesn't usually repeat. Mark Andrews, 1361 yards, 153 targets. His second highest total for his career was back in 2019 with 852 yards on 64 catches. Not usually repeated. You look at that Ravens offense last year, the running game was decimated. The wide receivers were hurt. We had lots of quarterback issues injury-wise. Uh, sure, they lost Hollywood Brown, but Rashad Bateman's breakout seems like it's incoming. And those running backs are better now. They're healthier. J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards seem like they're on track. Uh, to be worth that mid-high second round pick, he needs to repeat what he did last year. He needs to not only be a tight end one, tight end two, along with Travis Kelsey, but have that huge separation from the tight end three that he had last year. I'm not interested. I don't think it's a repeat. I think he's going to be very good, but I don't think he's going to be any better than that next tier of tight ends that's going 20 picks later. I'm talking Kyle Pitts. Literally 20 picks later, you can get Kyle Pitts. You want 153 targets again? Kyle Pitts is probably the better option 20 picks later. And I'm even okay taking George Kittle, Darren Waller. You're getting injury discounts. They're going after Pitts. Uh, and I'm also okay just waiting on tight end. I'm okay looking at TJ Hawkinson in the middle rounds or just platooning the position and taking three players late, late, late and hoping one of them hits. Mark Andrews, 17.1, not interested at all. Not interested at all. I'm going to go quarterback next. Joe Burrow has an ADP of 70.7. He is the QB7 off the board right now. He finished as the QB8 last season, and he was the QB9 before those two monster games in Week 16 and Week 17. I'm not interested in Joe Burrow at QB7. I like him. The Bengals' offense is definitely exciting, but anyone who rostered Burrow last year isn't surprised by me bringing him up right now. 
Uh, he was a mercurial roller coaster of a quarterback to have in redraft formats last season. Uh, and he was coming off an injury and the offense was phenomenal. Sure. He might run a little bit more now, but I, I think that's a big hope that he's going to repeat his best performances for an entire season and that he's going to run more when you're drafting him ahead of guys like Russell Wilson and Dak Prescott, who you can make the same argument for and are available later. Uh, there's not a lot of room for Joe Burrow to get better. I feel like a regression after being the upstart team seems more likely for the Bengals, even if even if they're still really good. Uh, or you could take another prolific passer. If you like that archetype, the, the passer that's not going to give you a lot of rushing yards, you could take Tom Brady at 79.9 or even Matt Stafford at 94.7. That's 25 picks later. You get Matt Stafford, who's an elite thrower and is going to continue to throw the ball. I don't hate Burrow, but I hate him at pick 70.7 and the QB7 off the board. And I've talked about this a little bit on TMAP, but Elijah Moore at 66.3 seems really high. I, I like Elijah Moore. His second year receivers, uh, exciting. I think the Jets have a lot of upside when you look at that offense. We don't fully know what exactly they're going to be. We don't know how Zach Wilson's going to progress in his second year. There were definitely signs of life toward the end of last season. Elijah Moore had a really good like three or four week stretch in the middle of the season last year. Talented. He should rack up targets, but he's being drafted around Amari Cooper and Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, Devontae Smith, Drake London, Adam Thielen. Those guys are going after Elijah Moore. And I think that you, when you draft him that high, you're drafting him hoping for pretty much everything to go right. The Jets offense needs to be good. Zach Wilson needs to be prolific and take that big step forward. And Elijah Moore's going to have to get more targets than Corey Davis and, and Garrett Wilson. Now, I know nobody likes Corey Davis, but he was hurt last year and is still brought in on a big deal and is still going to start outside. So he's still going to be a part of that offense along with Garrett Wilson, their top 10 uh, pick in the NFL draft. Uh, and I haven't even mentioned Braxton Berrios, Denzel Mims, and CJ Ozoma, uh, who are all part of that offense. I, it's a lot of draft capital to put into a player uh, on a team that's a big question mark that added talent at his position. Uh, he's going 37 picks before Garrett Wilson, and Corey Davis is free at pick 153 right now. You can get Corey Davis for literally nothing. So I'd much rather gamble on the Jets ancillary receivers, the other players, uh, the Zach Wilson. I'd rather uh, gamble on those Jets players rather than pay up big for Elijah Moore, uh, even though I do like the player. Uh, finally, I'm going to go with uh, another running back here. Travis Etienne is going ADP 41.1. Uh, I see the upside with ETN, but just like Elijah Moore, you, you're kind of buying him expecting the best case scenario. He's coming off an injury. Uh, James Robinson's still in the fold. I know he's hurt, and I know uh, James Robinson may not be ready for the start of the season, uh, but you're spending a middle fourth rounder on Travis ETN. He's going ahead of Cam Akers and David Montgomery, Josh Jacobs, Antonio Gibson. Uh, all those guys have question marks, but they all have some proven production, which Travis ETN does not. Uh, I like the Jags offense. I think it will get better, but it still might stink. Like the new coaching staff isn't tied to Travis Etienne. Uh, they already have a lot of shifty slot guys to throw the ball to. They brought in Christian Kirk. They still got LaVisca Chenault running around. So uh, Travis Etienne, all the things that you that you like about him, the the slot receiver potential, the catching the ball, the, the elite athleticism, all those things that you like about him are put into question. And that ADP of 41.1 doesn't bake in all those question marks. I would love Travis Etienne 50 picks later, but right now this is way too rich for me. I, I'll buy him in dynasty i'm interested in him as a late upside pick but not someone that i'm banking on as my rb2 rb3 which is what you're expecting if you take him at 41.1 so thanks so much for checking out this video. Uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Like I said, hear us on the most accurate podcast every week talking about fantasy football information that matters to you. Have a good day.